Good morning, everyone. We have several topics to cover today, and I appreciate everyone tuning in. First, I know many are looking forward uh, to a return of competition for certain school and youth sports. Admittedly, our approach in this area has been amongst the most cautious in the nation because we believe in taking small steps forward and monitoring the data before moving further. Two weeks ago, we moved into phase two of our guidance. Since then, we've been watching the data and now feel comfortable taking the next step and allow competition with some additional safety measures. Secretary Moore will be providing more details in a few minutes. Next, as you may recall, when our numbers first began to increase in November, after a summer and early fall of very low transmission, contact tracers found that Halloween parties and other larger multi-household gatherings had a major impact on the spread of the virus. This led us to having to place further restrictions in place for Thanksgiving and December holidays. I know the Super Bowl is the most watched event of the year and look forward to watching it myself on Sunday. But I want to be clear, this won't be a, a typical or nor should it be a typical Super Bowl party year. The risk is too high and multi-household gatherings are still not allowed. We're only months away from when our most at-risk friends, family, and neighbors are able to get the vaccine. Now is not the time to let our guard die down, especially when the light at the tunnel is in sight. And to all the parents who've been reaching out about school sports, don't ruin this for your kids. If there are too many gatherings that lead to greater spread, we'd be forced to take action, which none of us want to do. So if you want to keep moving forward and slowly opening the spigot again, please follow the guidance. Because the last thing we want to do is move backwards. But as I've shown, I'm willing to do whatever is necessary to keep people safe. Next, we reached an important milestone yesterday. Over 10% of eligible Vermonters have now received at least their first dose of the vaccine. And this is good news. It means every single day we're getting closer to protecting those at most risk of death and getting back to normal. With the recent news that our supply will increase or over at least the next three weeks, and Johnson Johnson seeking approval, we're confident our pace will continue to accelerate and we'll get to 20% of the population much faster than we got to 10%. We're moving through our first age band, 75 and over, at a good rate, and we anticipate being able to open registration to the next group before the end of the month. Secretary Smith will be giving uh, updates on vaccines, including our homebound vaccination rollout as well. And lastly, we'll get an education update from Secretary French, who will give us an important reminder of why we need to stay vigilant this weekend, because our kids uh, need to be in school, and the choices we make as adults directly impact them. And I hope everyone takes this responsibility to heart. Secretary French will talk about what the Agency of Education and Department of Health are learning about the impact remote learning has had, and also identify ways to address it. We know how difficult this has been for all Vermonters, but it's especially impacted our kids, and we must do everything we can to address this and ensure they receive the support they need so they're on the right path to succeed in the future. With that, I'll now turn it over to Secretary French. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. I'll begin my report with an update on the weekly PCR surveillance testing in schools. Uh, we don't have any results this week to share uh, because of the snowstorm uh, that was on Tuesday. Uh, we have been running uh, this testing on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. With a storm, we decided to move Tuesday's testing to Thursday, and it typically takes a few days to get the results back, so Wednesday's results should be back soon, but Thursday's won't be back in until the weekend. Uh, so I'll provide an update on this week's results at next week's uh, press conference. As we plan for a recovery phase in education, uh, we will need to understand the impact of the emergency on our students so we can focus and prioritize our response. 
I asked the Principals Association to send out a quick survey to their members this week with a simple question, how are your students doing academically? 58 principals responded to the survey. I thought I would share some of the responses to give folks an idea of what principals are seeing in their schools. One principal wrote, as always, there's a range of student outcomes. We have more students who are struggling, not passing courses or in credit than in a normal year. We have more students who are substantially disengaged from school at risk of dropping out. We have more of our high achieving students with tremendously high stress levels than usual. One principal observed that they're still working to close the gaps from the period of sustained remote learning that occurred in the spring. That principal wrote, even with five days of in-person learning per week since September, we continue to work to close gaps from remote learning in the spring. Absenteeism this year is a huge concern. It is hard to even consider a truancy when there are so many factors that keep kids from coming to school. Absenteeism or a lack of engagement was a central concern in many of the comments. Uh, one principal said, we have a handful of students who are elective remote, learning from home five days a week, who rarely attend their virtual classes or advisories, and who refuse to respond to our numerous attempts to contact them. Even staff members going to the house or the use of a truancy officer doesn't affect change. On the other hand, several principals reported that some groups of students are maintaining their academic achievement levels in spite of these challenges and cited specific data. One principal reported, we've been in person all year. We did close our middle school for three days before Thanksgiving because of COVID case. These students followed our short-term closure plans for those three days. We assessed students in grades second through eight, and when we retested in January, 80% of our students were proficient in math. We saw great growth in some of our students living, living in poverty and those on IEPs. Reading was less successful with only 68, 66% proficient, but we need to retest a few students who rushed to the test and didn't do their best work. I'm hoping for better results when we finish retesting. Another principal said, we were initially very concerned about a large drop in our math and reading data. What we found was that although there was a decrease, it was only by a few percentage points. Several grades actually maintain where they were from last year as well. Students are making gains this year, but it's harder to reach those that need the most support. A common theme expressed in almost all the comments was the need to attend to the social and emotional needs of students, regardless of how students are doing academically. One principal summarized it this way, the general disposition of the students seems to have become much more passive. Class conversations are subdued Inquiry-based learning is incredibly difficult. There are hardly any field experiences, etc. The physical distancing has become emotional distancing, and it will take a coordinated effort to make sure that we have systems in place to help students reconnect with their peers, their teachers, and to reestablish establish relationships in the school building and re-engage in their pre-pandemic school lives. I want to thank the Principals Association for sending out the survey and for the principals who took time out of their exceedingly busy schedules to share their comments. I think their comments are useful in understanding some of the complexity of the situation. In spite of these complexities and challenges, I remain very proud of the work our school staff have done in responding to the needs of our students during this very challenging time. There have been several national news reports this week about large urban districts in our country that are still struggling with reopening their schools. In several of these districts, schools have remained closed since last March. Uh, we are very fortunate uh, that we live in a state that prioritizes keeping our schools open. That being said, we have a lot of work to do in the coming months to address the needs of our students. The impact of this emergency has not been the same for all students, and we need to understand the impact so we can prioritize our response. I suspect we will find some students are doing fine academically, whereas others are struggling. Students that were at risk before the emergency are probably more at risk now. And there are groups of students about which we do not know enough because they have not been fully engaged in the learning process. <clears throat> they have dropped below our radar and we need to act with some urgency to re-engage with them. As noted by the principals, we can expect that many of our students have been adversely impacted from a social and emotional perspective. Children tend to be more resilient than adults, but the isolation of the pandemic has not been healthy for them since much of their development is predicated on social interactions with their peers. The comments from the principals also suggest there is starting to be a cumulative effect of emergency conditions on our students that goes beyond simple characterizations such as learning loss. As one principal observed, 
The longer this goes on, the more students have drifted away. This has profound implications for their academic growth. The situation in front of us is fairly complex, but the starting point in the solution is fairly simple. The restoration of in-person instruction, in-person routines, and in-person relationships as soon as possible. Through the restoration of more in-person contact and normal school routines, we can improve our ability to meet the needs of students. That concludes my updates. I'll now turn it over to uh, Secretary Moore. Thank you, Secretary French. Good morning. I'm pleased to be able to provide more details regarding next steps in our return to play for both school-based and recreational sports. Specifically, effective next Friday, February 12th, both interscholastic and youth leagues will be able to resume game play. This includes basketball and hockey, as well as indoor soccer and futsal, broomball and volleyball. This is in addition to the guidance issued previously, which provided a framework for snow sports competition, as well as virtual meets for indoor sports involving low or no contact, such as individual swimming, bowling, figure skating, dance, and gymnastics. As has been the case throughout the pandemic, things will look different this winter. Teams engaged in indoor sports that involve close proximity or moderate contact will be limited to no more than two games in any seven day period and allow a minimum of at least three days between competitions. Spectators will not be allowed. Only key personnel, players, coaches, officials, time and scorekeepers, and credentialed media can be in attendance at indoor sports events. We recognize that this will come as a disappointment to parents and fans of local teams, but minimizing the number of people present is essential to appropriately managing the risk associated with indoor sports events. Teams are encouraged to look for other creative solutions that allow for remote viewing, including designating a single volunteer to live stream games. And the masking mandate for all players and staff that has been in place since this fall is being extended to referees and officials for indoor sports events. Updated guidance with additional detail for both school-based and recreational sports will be available on the state's website by the end of the day on Monday. It's important to acknowledge the clear commitment by players, coaches, parents alike that has brought us to this point. From December 26th, when no contact winter sports practices got underway until mid-January, we did not see any evidence of virus exposure during practice. Put another way, by maintaining physical distance during practice, even if a team member came down with COVID, their teammates were not considered close contacts and therefore at little risk of becoming sick themselves. This success allowed for the transition to expanded practices, including team-based scrimmages on January 18th. And over the past two and a half weeks, while there have been close contacts identified within teams, we have not seen evidence of teammates transmitting the virus to one another. This again reflects strong adherence to the safety precautions established in the guidance, chief among them wearing masks, avoiding unnecessary physical contact, and adopting an arrive, play, leave mentality. As we know that for as many people who will be excited about today's announcement, there are others that will be uncomfortable. Please know we will continue to actively follow the case data. And should data emerge that indicates evidence of COVID-19 transmission or significant disruption to ac academic instruction because of sports-related activities, additional restrictions may become necessary, including targeted or even whole wholesale suspension of games and competitions. The results that we've achieved are far from guaranteed and reflect the hard work of many. In order for Vermont's return to play to continue to be successful, it is important that the collective commitment of players, coaches, and parents to essential health and safety measures, masking, physical distancing, and foregoing team-based social activities remain steadfast. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith for a vaccine update. Thank you, Secretary Moore. 
As of today, 58,219 eligible Vermonters have been vaccinated against COVID-19. That's 33,700 Vermonters received their first dose and 24,500 have received their second dose. So far, 21% of Vermonters in the 75 years old and above age group have received their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine and 33,100 have registered so far. As I've mentioned earlier in the week, we've added clinics, clinics in Allberg to serve that area and the upper part of Grand Isle County, and a clinic in Beecher Falls to serve Essex County. Next week, we plan to open a clinic at Grace Cottage Hospital in Wyndham County and Northwestern Hospital in Franklin County, and the week after, Mount Escutney Hospital, uh, we plan to open up as well. We are also working with other hospitals to establish vaccination clinics. Last night, we held a clinic for those with limited uh, English proficiency in Burlington, where we vaccinated 50 people, and tonight um, in Winooski, for another 50 people, we will continue to uh, uh, allocate more for that community in the age group 75 and up. We recently received final CDC guidance on transporting vaccines for those that are homebound. We're happy to report that the homebound program will receive its first allotment of vaccine today. Today's allotment will include agencies covering Caledonia, Franklin, Orange, Windsor, and Wyndham counties with expanded distribution anticipated next week. Uh, vaccinations will begin immediately and will be administered through a partnership between local home health and EMS agencies. These first partnerships include Rescue Inc. EMS, Visiting Nurse and Hospice for Vermont and New Hampshire, Caledonia Home Health and Care, and hospice and Franklin County Home Health and Caledonia um, Essex EMS. The first group of designated recipients includes Vermonters in the 75 and older age group who are both homebound and in the service of local home health agencies, including both VNA agencies and and others. Vaccinate vac um, vaccinating agencies will contact them to arrange the vaccination visit. Please do not contact the home health agencies. They will contact you. We recognize there are homebound community members who do not receive home health services that will need to be vaccinated. Once the initial group of roughly 2,000 statewide individuals have home health services, um, individuals with home health services are engaged, we will expand this service to include additional individuals in need. New, numerous partners, including primary care, agencies on aging, and municipalities are currently discussing how best to identify the additional individuals and to create the second phase of outreach. I want to express my and our appreciation to the state's EMS and home health providers for their help in vaccinating homebound Vermonters. Now let's turn to eligible individuals in Group 1A, which includes healthcare workers. Anyone that qualifies to be in this group will continue to be eligible for vaccination. Hospitals will continue to receive allocations of vaccine for the purpose of vaccinating individuals whose appointments were delayed or they chose not to receive the vaccination at the time it was offered, or our new employees. We are not adding additional designations to Group 1A, only those professions already identified are eligible. As we are currently experiencing, there will be some overlap while we transition from one group to another. Again, anyone who is an eligible, who is eligible to be vaccinated in Group 1A will still be eligible. We have asked hospitals how many people they think they have in the 1A population. It, it has and will continue to fluctuate as people change their mind about receiving the vaccine, are newly hired, 
or contact the hospital to identify themselves as health care providers. But it is now approximately, from what we have gathered from the hospitals, about 2,500. We have also asked how many vaccines hospitals anticipate they can administer in the next week. Based upon their request, we are allocating 880 first doses for next week. Additional doses will continue to be made on an ongoing basis. We are in regular communications with the hospitals and provided additional clarification and guidance for them to administer the vaccine to eligible individuals. And we expect the 1A group will continue to be vaccinated, although the appointments may not be at the preferred date and time as the individual would like. Eligible in, uh, individuals should contact the hospital in their area to register. Please do not register on healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine website, as that is currently only available to Vermonters 75 and older. We are making progress along all fronts, but this is not a sprint. It will take time. We must all be patient, vigilant, and continue to wear our masks, wash our hands, maintain our six-foot distance, curb large gatherings, and do our part to protect families and fellow Vermonters from COVID-19. Lastly, um, I, I want to say this because we keep getting a lot of questions on this. Please remember, there is no waiting list for extra doses at the end of the day. You cannot sign up for um, extra doses at the end of the day. We're still getting multiple inquiries for placing one's name on a waiting list. Again, there is no waiting list that you can sign up for. We are striving to prevent wasted doses in the vaccination program. So here is how we are doing it. Uh, again, and I had mentioned this previously, we have the list of eligible Vermonters 75 years old and older that have registered for vaccines in each area that we can use. In addition, we know uh, the Vermonters in 1A that have yet to receive their vaccine that are eligible. And we have lists of homebound 75 plus that are eligible. These are the priority groups that we will call if there are extra doses at the end of the day. However, the prime objective is to prevent wasted doses. And if as a last resort, a vaccine has to be administered to a person not eligible in order to prevent waste, local health clinics are given permission to do so. I don't want to create an atmosphere where people feel they will be punished and therefore might opt to waste a dose out of fear of doing the wrong thing rather than administering a dose to prevent waste. A dose of vaccine administered is better than a dose of vaccine lost. <clears throat> So if you're, just to end with this, um, and, and the governor had mentioned this, we will be moving in, in the next few weeks to the next phase. So if you are 75 years old and older, please register by going online at the health department's website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or call our registration center at 855-722-7878. Um, I'll now turn it over for, to Dr. Levine for a health department update. Thank you. As you may have noticed, our seven-day case numbers continue to trend slightly downward at a lower level. Today, we're reporting 107 cases. Our seven-day average is in the low 130 vicinity. We're reporting no additional deaths, and our percent positivity rate remains below 2%, just below 1.9%. We are continuing to monitor increased spread of the virus in Bennington County and finalizing plans to increase testing opportunities in that area. Testing sites will include the northern half of the county, and we are engaging the ski industry in this effort as well. 
Testing is, of course, the first step in our continued effort to contain the spread of the virus. And we want all residents of the county to have ready access to this opportunity to help themselves and potentially their families and their communities. And of course, we urge everyone to be extra vigilant and to maximize distancing, masking, and avoiding crowded indoor settings. As I've said before, what's going on in Bennington County could occur anywhere in the state. The situation there began with multi-household gatherings in early December and does reflect to a minor degree the increased virus activity in neighboring New York State and possibly visitors to ski resorts. But I must stress that the majority is just plain community transmission at work sites and throughout communities. And as you just saw, there's an encouraging downturn in cases of late. And hospitalizations at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center have stabilized. Regional hospitals and facilities to receive recovering COVID patients have been very responsive to that hospital's need. But we know that hospitalizations lag behind the peak of cases, so we'll be watching these very closely and supporting the region as much as is needed. Today's hospitalization number is 55. We've come down from where it was briefly in the 60 range. ICU at 17. We also are continuing our efforts to detect any potential variants of the virus through genetic sequencing of certain specimens taken from various parts of the state. We're expecting our first results in the early part of next week. The B117 variant, first identified in the United Kingdom, has now been detected in 33 states. And as I've said before, we expect we'll see it in Vermont as well. It is normal for viruses to mutate, but some of the variants recently found may require us to strengthen our prevention measures. We continue to strategically look for variants to help Vermonters take any steps necessary to protect themselves and one another. As I mentioned, we're reporting no additional deaths today. The count remains at 181, and the trend continues to improve. A significant reason for this is the recently lower number of cases and hospitalizations, and hence deaths, in long-term care facilities. In this context, I do want to call attention to a report our team just put out on COVID-19 in our long-term care facilities. Some key findings of the report. 71% of long-term care facilities have not had an outbreak or seen any cases of COVID-19. There was a steep drop in the COVID-19 incidence rate among staff and residents of these facilities from December to January. Keep in mind, this is in the setting of an even more aggressive testing strategy using Binax now antigen tests often daily as well as a hugely successful vaccination program in those facilities. Long-term care residents have counted for two-thirds of all COVID-related deaths in Vermont. Please view this number in the context of Vermont having the lowest death rate in the nation and in the rationale we have repeatedly stated for our overall vaccination strategy. One thing you may be surprised to note is that 65% of long-term care facilities that identified a single case in their facility did not see additional spread. This is testimony to the wonderful work of our healthcare associated outbreak prevention and response teams that do work 24 seven and the infection control policies we have developed and provided and these facilities have complied with. You now have heard from several speakers about our plans for youth sports competition. So I will only emphasize that again, our current Vermont epidemiologic data does reinforce these decisions. We are not finding indoor sports or fueling outbreaks since we moved to the most recent phase, nor just as importantly, are they disrupting in-person learning. 
By continuing to take careful steps forward, we believe we can expand our allowances around sports so that our youth can compete safely. But as Secretary Moore detailed, the privilege of competition comes with a number of very important pieces of guidance and expectations regarding the conduct of games and the behavior of athletes and their families at those critical times before and after games and outside of school. But honestly, what worries me far more than youth sports is a certain American tradition coming on Sunday, the Super Bowl. Now this might seem like a more minor event than some of our recent holidays, but it has potential to truly damage the recent progress we've made here in Vermont if we don't celebrate safely. So if you're watching the Super Bowl, please stick to your own household. Gathering with anyone you don't live with increases the chances of spreading COVID-19, especially because you'll be indoors, close together, and I imagine eating or drinking without masks. Now the CDC has shared some tips like hosting a virtual watch party or simply starting a group text for game commentary. You can make your own special game day apps and snacks with people you live with or order takeout food and support your local restaurants. Luckily, as we all know, Super Bowl is a TV event, so we can still root for our favorite team, debate which commercials are the best, and enjoy the halftime show, all from the comfort of our own home safely. So you might say, how naive he is. What harm could come from this now? Is he really kidding? Those CDC recommendations sound like a joke. Well, I just want to remind you that it was Halloween gatherings and parties that really drove the beginning of our uptick in cases a mere three months ago, and it hasn't slowed down significantly yet. So consider following my and Dr. Fauci's Super Bowl Sunday advice and just say, stay, lay low, at least this time around. Finally, I'd like to end my comments on an optimistic note regarding vaccine. The vaccine developed by the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca has the potential to slow the transmission of virus. Now recall that we have talked in the past about how effective the new vaccines are in preventing severe disease, hospitalizations, and death. We've always kind of hedged on the ability of the vaccine to prevent transmission of virus from one's nasal secretions. While the new data is very preliminary and not yet peer reviewed, the investigators did the following. They watched vaccinated people for symptoms and for antibody production per usual, but they also swabbed their noses for virus and they found a 67% reduction in positive nasal swabs among those vaccinated compared to those not. This means the vaccine kept people safe and helped prevent them from passing the virus to others. We look forward to such study uh, on an ongoing basis and hopefully for replication of these findings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. All right, it is 11.41, and we do have 27 uh, reporters in the queue, so we'll just ask folks to really keep your questions focused and limited. Uh, we'll start with Calvin. Um, thank you, Governor. So um, following up on the 1099G forms, um, I'm wondering what, what more you can share with us about you know, the next steps in the process, what people should do. Um, your message, potentially, to Vermonters that are searching for answers, and also maybe uh, if you have an estimate of how much it's going to cost to uh, provide some of these uh, identity protection services to Vermonters. Well, again, I don't have all the details at this point in time. Um, as you know, within 48 hours, uh, we implemented a plan. Uh, we put, uh, you know, I think about it in three uh, buckets, three groupings. Uh, first, we want to make sure that uh, we rectify the situation so that we can get the 1099s in the hands of those who need them, right? So uh, we put a team together in order to accomplish that. Uh, let's get, uh, let's uh, make sure that we, we perform the task at hand. 
Uh, the second uh, bucket was uh, making sure that we had protection for those who may be impacted. And so we put another team together uh, to do that uh, as well. Uh, the third piece was to, uh, you know, an after action kind of plan to see what happened. Um, so we've been working on that simultaneous we, uh, to, uh, to the auditor. I gave the auditor a call myself to ask for his assistance, uh, which he graciously accepted. So um, he's working on that. We have, uh, we believe, we found uh, that it was a human error uh, in, uh, in some of the, the process, um, but that doesn't excuse uh, the fact that we didn't have the controls in place to, uh, to, to find that when it was, uh, when it was first initiated. So um, we uh, certainly uh, ap apologize to all those uh, impacted. Uh, this was something that shouldn't have happened. Uh, we are going to make this right. Uh, we're going to, uh, to work again to make sure that we get, uh, get all the piece of information out to the people who need it and we get the 1099s back uh, as well as uh, making sure that we put uh, quality control provisions in place uh, in the future. So this goes across the board. It's, uh, it's uh, again, a tough learning experience for all involved, uh, but we're, we're working on this. And, uh, and I think, uh, again, we, we tried to do this as quick as possible, but I think the teams in place are doing their work. Um, in quick follow-up, yesterday, um, the full Senate, as you've probably seen, voted to push back on your Act 250 executive order. I believe the House, maybe while, while as we're speaking, uh, is, is voting to do the same on your Agency of Public Service, um, or, or um, Public Safety executive order. Uh, what, what do you make of, of the legislature pushing back on, on some of your, uh, your orders? Well, again, it, it depends on what we are where we go from here. Uh, we believe that there are good ideas. Restructuring government is part of what I've said we would do, uh, trying to find a more efficient process that uh, gives uh, Vermonters the benefit of, of that efficiency and, and cost controls and so forth. We just think there's a better way of doing uh, accomplishing this. So where they go from here, uh, depending on what the other body does, because uh, we believe uh, constitutionally each, both bodies have to, uh, have to say no, um, because you know, the, it's, it's clear uh, that we have the ability to do this. And it's a yes until they say no from both bodies um, because they're one, one body, one legislative branch, so to speak, if you, if you can think about it in that way. Um, so we'll see what, what happens from there. But if they turn them down, uh, I have heard uh, from the media, from reading, uh, that they end from uh, Senator Bray in particular. He wrote to us and said that he was more than willing to take this up and work to uh, to see what we're, where we could go with this, but again, keep in mind, especially with the Act 250, this is just one piece of a lot of uh, a lot of need there. Um, we need to modernize Act 250 after 50 years. Uh, there are a number of provisions we had asked for last year didn't make it across the finish line. Uh, this is just one piece in this executive order uh, to restructure government to to provide for. Uh, a more streamlined uh, uh, process uh, on the front end, but there are many other pieces that need to be taken up. We hear this uh, all the time, and I believe legislators do as well. So I'm gonna take them at the word uh, that they are more than willing to take this up, and we'll see where we go from here. Thank you. All set. All set. Stewart, NBC5. Uh, good morning. Uh, I had a pretty good question, I thought, from a, a viewer who asked uh, when the state might update quarantine rules and um, visitors' guidance at hospitals for those people who are fully vaccinated, two doses. Uh, uh, secondly, if a fully vaccinated individual travels out of state, will the quarantine requirements uh, be reduced when they return? Um, so could a fully vaccinated individual visit a family member in the hospital yet? And uh, what about the out-of-state return? Yeah, I think those, those are great questions. Uh, again, we're contemplating all the above. I think uh, across the nation, people are, are trying to uh, wrap their arms around this and what does it really mean? Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Levine to comment, but I, I do want to, and not just hospital uh, hospitals and vis visitation, but long-term care facilities is where you know, uh, we've talked a lot about and uh, we want to get them back to some sort of normalcy as quick as possible because they uh, have had their vaccines and, 
and uh, they've been impacted from the very beginning. Um, so we want to make sure that we focus on that area first, um, but uh, Dr. Levine, he might be able to comment further. These are wonderful questions, and I uh, wish we were a couple weeks ahead to be able to give you the more definitive answers, um, because obviously the first parts deal with things that have been restricted, mainly visitation, whether it be hospitals or long-term care facilities. But the second part deals with new freedoms. So if you're in a long-term care facility, not only have a visitor, but have dinner with somebody else uh, at the table and perhaps engage in other kinds of uh, group activities that they're always craving to do in those facilities. And then you mentioned travel as well uh, and uh, need for quarantine or lack of need to quarantine. So we're all grappling with this at this time, as is the uh, Centers for Disease Control in, in Atlanta as well. Currently, there's um, only one state that I'm aware of uh, that has loosened up restrictions in terms of saying that you can travel and not have to quarantine when you come back. But that leaves almost the whole country that still hasn't yet made that decision. As a state health official, uh, this is a major topic on our agendas all the time. We're all kind of waiting a little longer for some data to be able to support a decision in a much more uh, evidence-based, data-driven way. And we're waiting to see if the CDC is going to be moving in that direction as well. Since we're pretty early in the vaccine scheme, uh, we feel comfortable waiting a little bit longer uh, to make these decisions. I would also add that uh, unlike where we've been through the pandemic all of last year, um, it would really be preferable to have states be in alignment with one another as opposed to one state does it one way, another state does it another way. Uh, that would create a lot of havoc when it comes to just travel alone and what you need to do when you enter a state, when you need to do when you come back to your own state, et cetera. So, uh, we're all kind of hoping that uh, part of the new theme and the new administration seems to be developing more national strategies and that this will be one of them. So the ultimate answer, Stuart, is uh, stay tuned, uh, but that we're working in the directions that the questions are implying um, and meeting on them all the time. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, but, Governor, we know what you're going to be doing on Sunday night, uh, but who do you like? Um, well, mixed emotions, obviously. Uh, Tom Brady uh, and the New England Patriots is, are my favorite uh, team. Uh, you're and, not over uh, that yet? I'm not quite over that, but in this situation, uh, I'll be rooting for uh, the Buccaneers. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, I think this question is probably for uh, Dr. Levine. Um, I went to visit my doctor yesterday, and uh, instead of talking entirely about my health, he had uh, a question about the ranking for distribution of vaccines. And his concern was that by putting people with pre-existing conditions uh, far down the list, that uh, there's the potential to risk um, death in a group uh, of people who have illnesses uh, such as COPD. And he also suggested that many of the people with this kind of chronic conditions are among the group of people that you had said the state is interested in uh, making sure they reach out to because uh, in many occasions in the past, uh, such groups have been um, not had uh, uh, adequate health care. And the question, I guess, is um, where at this point are the people with 
pre-existing conditions in line? Uh, has that changed? Uh, are you thinking about it in different terms than you have before? I think the simple answer is no, but I'll let Dr. Levine, and hopefully, Joe, you got some sort of uh, discount or rebate uh, to forward this question. What I was going to say, it sounds like you have a wonderful relationship with your primary care physician, and you can just talk about anything, and uh, that's, that's always a good thing. Uh, so the answer was no. I, I guess I have to expound on that a little lo longer, though, just to uh, do justice to it. Keep in mind uh, the North Star we're all following, which is preserving life, preventing death. and. Uh, a couple of press conferences ago, we showed a kind of heat map and showed where the red line was between where people were uh, dying of COVID and where they weren't. And out of 180 deaths now in the state, there's in the vicinity of 10 that occurred below the age of 65. Some of those may indeed have had chronic disease. Um, and certainly, the other 170 above the red line uh, we know must have had a lot of chronic diseases, and uh, we're preparing even more analysis to look at that. But we really uh, want to respect the age banding that we've uh, uh, put into play here, because it really does respect what the data in Vermont shows. And if we want to really make sure we preserve life and don't have further deaths, the more quickly we can vaccinate 65 and above, the closer to achieving that goal will be. Uh, keep in mind, based on the numbers we've given you, that's perhaps um, a fifth to a sixth of the population of the state. Um, so it's not like having a chronic condition, and I prefer to call it having a high-risk condition because not all conditions are chronic, but having a high-risk condition. Um, that doesn't put you at the bottom of the list. It doesn't mean you are low priority. It's just we're trying to get as quickly as possible through the people at the very highest risk. So this next category will come along, you know, in the fairly close future. We're not talking about August or September. We're talking in the spring. And we're going to be able to get to them pretty quickly. And um, they will still have been a priority. It is just a real challenge when every uh, individual or advocacy group has a reason to be prioritized. And in, 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 in you know, full transparency here, we would love to move people uh, to the front of the list. I get requests all the time about people who are in the high-risk condition list and why isn't my condition in the list versus another condition. So in the ideal world, we'd have abundant allocation of vaccine and be able to accomplish that goal. Can you bring something back to your doctor now? Um, well, not right away, I hope. Um, <laughs> I have another question. This one's actually from a nurse, so, but, but not from the same practice. Uh, this person is curious about what the recovered number uh, means in the state figures and she's particularly um, interested in whether there's a support system for people who've recovered but continue to have symptoms. And ultimately, I think the question is whether these people ought to be vaccinated. Yeah, so, there, you know, it, everything happens by coincidence. And literally, uh, at the beginning of this week, I re-engaged my uh, EPI data team and saying, why are we even showing the number uh, recovered? Uh, what meaning does it have to people? Because I think people have sort of lost track of what, why that was even there in the first place and uh, do they even notice the number anymore? Um, technically, the number means that uh, you've either reported back to us after your illness resolved and we know you are doing fine or that 30 days has gone by and um, we haven't heard from you, but you haven't been in the hospital or had anything worse happen, so you were considered technically recovered from that acute illness. But we know, as your question is implying, that there's a small subset of patients who three to four 
or longer months later don't feel completely well when they should have resolved all of the initial symptoms. They have lingering symptoms. They're often called long haul patients. And we're still, as a country and as a state, trying to grapple with how big that group is and uh, how to address their concerns and hopefully improve their quality of life because many of them uh, report significant fatigue, significant shortness of breath, and other symptoms that um, should have gone away when they technically recovered from their infection. So I've given some thought to not even reporting the word recovered anymore because it just has too broad a meaning and not as specific a meaning as would be helpful. It would imply that every single person who's in the recovered category has connected with us or we've connected with them and we know exactly what their status is, which is clearly not true when you're dealing with the uh, thousands and thousands of people we're talking about. We are studying them at this point, um, working uh, to uh, understand that better in terms of how frequent it happens in Vermont and we'll be interviewing a number of people uh, to figure that out. Um, but I don't have any data from that now. That's gonna take many, many months. There are some clinics that have popped up that are deal, I shouldn't say popped up as if that was a nefarious thing, that, that have uh, been implemented uh, to actually uh, have people with chronic symptoms visit them and uh, provide the appropriate supports. Um, we're doing some education with the uh, physician community in general because this is a very challenging group of patients because no one's ever encountered them before and there aren't a lot of answers to a lot of the questions that they ask or that they uh, provide in the context of their care. So, um, you know, the major note uh, of uh, takeaway here is that this is an evolving uh, situation that science and uh, the nation don't really understand well yet. Even though we're now almost a year into this pandemic, it's really clear that uh, the long haul syndrome is poorly understood and uh, how to deal with it and educate people about it is not well factored in yet. Uh, thank you. This is also a question for Dr. Levine. You mentioned that Vermont has started, started to detect for variants in the virus uh, frequently. You might need to strengthen the preventative measures. That looks like. I'm not sure anybody in the room heard every word you said. Could, could you repeat it? Because you, oh, you were fading in and out. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Um, you mentioned that Vermont is detecting, starting to detect for variants in the virus. And, um, and if we start to see them frequently, the state may need to strengthen its preventative measures. Um, and so I was wondering what, what would that look like? What kind of things sure. would have to take place? Sure. So you're right. We are uh, testing for the for the uh, variant through genomic sequencing. And um, I would submit, I would only take one to have an announcement about the fact that it's in Vermont and we need to really double down on our efforts. Uh, I wouldn't want to see a trend because one means it's here and even if we don't detect it in every specimen, it will soon become more prevalent. So obviously, Six foot distancing is sort of here to stay. That's not going to change. Avoiding crowded situations is for the, for the uh, present time here to stay. It's not gonna change. The thing that uh, a lot of people are talking about uh, with a little science behind it, but not extensive, is masking itself. Not that we would give up masking. So the number one uh, message is if you haven't been masking, please, wear a mask. And it doesn't matter how sophisticated the mask might be, just wear a mask. 
But then, for those who have been consistent with their masking, there are a lot of questions coming about if they're using a cloth mask, should they double mask? And the answer to that is it probably is more beneficial to double mask than to single mask, but again, just masking alone provides a significant amount of benefit. The additional benefit coming from the double mask is oftentimes one mask is slipping and not completely uh, being stable on your face, so to speak. This would help that. And that there's oftentimes leakage uh, on the sides and that leakage might be less so that you'd have a more firm fit uh, and that would be fine. There's also questions about, about should I give up the cloth mask and buy a medical mask like a procedure mask or a surgical mask. And um, there is good data that shows that you will get some incremental benefit from uh, the more medical mask, which is not much more available now uh, in any medical supply store or pharmacy than it is uh, than it was back early in the pandemic. Uh, but again, it's not essential you switch from a cloth mask to a, a surgical mask, but you could. And then the last question that gets asked is, should I buy an N95? We still really do believe we should preserve the N95s for those in the healthcare world who really need them the most uh, for some of those procedures and, con and exposures that would be the highest risk. And it's probably not essential for most people to walk around with an N95 mask. Not to say that uh, they can't do that, but in the healthcare setting, those are fitted specially, and um, it's uh, a little more of an ordeal than you would think if you were uh, just buying it on your own. There's also these KN95s, which are the ones you would find on the marketplace now because they're uh, produced outside the United States, and the United States didn't really gear up its own N95 production to take care of a whole population. I would just caution people that the KN95s predominantly are uh, authentic, but there is a counterfeit market. And uh, I believe on the CDC website or the FDA website, there is some information in a long appendix about the various ones that are out there, so that if you had the opportunity to purchase one, you want to check it against the list to make sure it's on the approved list. So it's mainly in the masking category that um, things would get tighter. There's not much else people can do if a variant um, begins to take hold here, um, just to be much more respectful of all of the guidance that we give all of the time. Okay, thank you very much. All right, I got a note that Greg might not be available, but I'm just gonna double check. Greg from the County Courier. All right, we'll loop back to Greg if he gets back on the line. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, I got a call from a reader today. She has two family members, both paraeducators. Para one works in a public school, the other one works at a private school. She said the one at the private school has received both shots of the vaccination and the other one at the public school hasn't, and she wanted to know why the difference. Secretary Smith. Eric, I, I will have to look further into this situation, but the way that you described it, none of those um, individuals should have been vaccinated. I don't, maybe it was a changing in how they labeled them compared to public and private staff? No, I'd be interested in it if, um, if, if you're available um, sometime uh, where we can call you. But I, uh, the way that you described it, none of those qualify for 1A. Okay, thank you. Eric, I'll make one exception. Are they over 75? I don't believe so, no. Okay, thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Good morning. Good afternoon. I just need a little clarification on Steve's question about traveling and quarantining. Can people in Vermont who are fully vaccinated have visitors from out of state who are also fully vaccinated without their visitors quarantining? 
we have not. That, yeah, that. Lisa, Lisa, we have not have not weighed in on that yet. I mean, this is a national conversation that is probably going to ripple down. We it's not that we haven't contemplated it yet. It's just that we haven't uh, decided what to do, uh, and we're looking for some uh, the CDC uh, to also weigh in on this. A national strategy would make much more sense than do it doing it individually. As as you said, if we decide to do it one way. And uh, your your friend in in Massachusetts decided to do it another. Uh, it just wouldn't work very well. So we need to um, to come together. And I know that Dr. Levine and his group, as well as uh, the governors, are are talking about these issues. But nothing um, nothing has been decided at this point. Okay, thank you. And several weeks ago, we were told that the COVID in the communities map and dashboard would be updated more frequently. Currently, it updates on Friday with data from the prior Wednesday. What's the status of that? Understanding that people need to consider that COVID is everywhere and act accordingly. It still is a nice touchstone for people to be able to check out what's happening in their town. Secretary Smith. Lisa, that's on me. Um, I've been so preoccupied with vac vaccination that I haven't followed up on that. I'll follow up on it and I'll get back to you. Great, thank you very much. Thanks for the time. Boston, Burlington Free Press. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Hi, right, thank you. Uh, and I believe my questions are best suited for either Governor Scott or Secretary Moore uh, regarding today's announcement about youth sports competition. Uh, my first question would be, why wait another week to start? Why not sooner? Uh, my understanding from many schools is that they could begin play as soon as today or tomorrow if given the chance. Yeah, we were, I'm going to let uh, Secretary Moore answer further if I don't get this right, but we had an agreement with the VPA to give them a certain amount of time. I think it was five days, actually. We just thought it made sense to go a week and make it effective next week. But that was our agreement with them. They needed uh, time to get ice and schedules and refs set up and so forth. So it's not as easy as just flicking the switch. Maybe you have another question. I'll, I'll let Secretary Moore answer that. Sure. I, I, I guess. Oh, sorry. Secretary Moore. Oh, I was just going to ask you if you were all set. So if you have another question, go ahead, Austin. Oh, yes, I, I do. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I was also curious uh, if any, and it, like if you could say how many uh, high school and youth sports teams had to either quarantine or were subject to contact tracing uh, since practices began back in December. That may be uh, Dr. Levine question. You know, <clears throat> my impression is, um, at least I can give you through January, I'm not sure I can break, date this back to December, but through January, we had isolated cases um, and perhaps isolated contacts, but no teams that were uh, in their entirety quarantined at the K through 12 level, difference at the college level. How many teams were affected by those isolated, uh, isolated cases? Oh, okay, I, I don't have the number at the top of my okay. fingers here, but not, not a huge number. I can say that um, probably within single digits of numbers, six to 10 across the okay. entire state. And then, okay. And, and then a last quick, clar quick clarifier. Um, I just want to make sure adult recreational sports are still off limits after today's announcement. That's correct. This has only uh, okay, implications great. at the youth level. Awesome. Thank you. Mike, the Islander. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks for backup. Secretary Smith, uh, thanks for your work on getting the shots out and getting everybody through perhaps the smallest bottleneck. Um, I'm just uh, and I fully understand there's no sign up to be on standby for extra shots 
at the vaccination site. But the question that was raised to me is, how can Vermonters 75 and up and the 1A group and the homebound that you mentioned be sure that they are, in fact, on some list for the local regional list if there are a few extra shots at some site in, say, St. Albans or Burlington or Alberg or, or wherever? How, does, how can somebody guarantee that they are, in fact, on that list? For the 75 and up they've registered, we'll use the same list that they registered on. So we would know uh, who is on the 75 plus list uh, because they've already registered. With the 1A, we already know that um, because we have a list of people that are that are waiting to get vaccinations uh, in the 1A uh, category or are eligible and are waiting for a call. Um, we would pull that off the list from that area. And then the homebound, we have we 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 will we do have lists of the homebound people, and we would coordinate it with EMS and the home health agency to say let's try to get that that vaccine to that person um, that day instead of a, a day that they may have scheduled. Um, we have all those lists, Mike, uh, that we use on a daily basis. We use them in in order to deliver vaccine to the homebound. We use them to make sure that um, there are 1A people that need to be vaccinated and we use them for the 75 and up. And, and how can the homebound be sure that they are in fact on, on, on one of your lists and yeah, they, that presumably the list that gets transferred to the local site that something doesn't get lost in the shuffle or, or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, the primary way we're going to deliver it to the homebound is um, uh, through the EMS and the local um, uh, the local agencies, um, the local, uh, you know, whether it's um, local home health agencies that we have out there. That will be the primary. Um, the, the secondary would be if there's an extra dose, then we would call home health. I, they, they will know they're on a list of home health because home health delivers their services uh, to them. The challenge we're going to have is those people that aren't, don't have home health uh, right now, and we're trying to develop a list right now of those people that, don't have, that are homebound that don't have uh, those home health uh, agencies working uh, with them right now. But the, the home health agencies right now know who they are. Uh, and and um, because they deliver services all the time to them. Great. My other question, Secretary French, uh, last month the Islander reported uh, a federal appeals court said the state of Vermont had clearly discriminated against the South Hero family and others similarly situated by blocking high school juniors and seniors from enrolling in classes at UVM and the state colleges. And the sole reason for the denial was, in one case, that the student went to Rice, and they also apparently denied other religious schools. Uh, just wondering what the state is doing in light of the court's ruling. Um, they gave a preliminary injunction, and the judges made it clear that the state appeared to have little hope at trial and ordered the state to allow students similarly situated to be able to get those classes that their parents are paying taxes on. So, Mike, your question was, what is what 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 a further action is the state taking regarding the injunction? To and and the discrimination that the judges seem to find in their ruling. Yeah, well, the ruling on the injunction isn't the final ruling on it. So, you know, it's, it's obviously a topic of um, some national interest. And, and for our perspective, it is, uh, I'll say from Vermont's perspective, um, a subject of active litigation. So we'll have to wait to see how the court ultimately reside, uh, resolves the issues. But the judges were pretty clear that the state of Vermont had little hope of prevailing in the case. Yeah, I, I would just say it's still, it's the, it hasn't reached its final conclusion in terms of the court process yet. So are students being allowed in, 
into those classes, at UVM and the state colleges? Yeah, the effect of the injunction is that if, if those districts were um, presented with a request for dual enrollment, they would process that in accordance with the, with the injunction. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Greg, the Bennington Banner. Uh, hello. Um, I believe my questions are going to be for uh, Dr. Levine and for uh, Secretary Smith. Uh, I was wondering if you could offer some more details on the, uh, in terms of the update on the situation in Bennington County, uh, specifically as to where more testing sites are being added, and uh, also if you could go into some more detail about, um, uh, I believe that there was some improvement that was alluded to. Um, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that first. Yeah, thank you. So in my uh, prepared remarks, I purposely didn't give you the exact site because I don't want to give a site if we haven't signed, sealed, and delivered it. That's really within okay. how, that's really within hours or a couple of days of being uh, uh, settled. So we will have announcements to make with regard to that. And then the second part of your question. Um, as to whether uh, you're seeing any positive trends, uh, I've realized that this uh, we've, been, we've been sort of working on this specifically uh, as a focus. Uh, this was meant you talked about that on Tuesday. I was um, you made some uh, notice of seeing some positive trends. I'm wondering what it is you're seeing. Yeah, so the trend we were looking at is really uh, new active cases, and um, over the last week there's been a slight. Uh, not dramatic, but a slight downtick in that, which is important because Bennington County really on its own uh, looked so much different than the rest of the state of Vermont in terms of the uh, curve of active cases. Uh, I will have to provide some caution though because in the 107 cases we're reporting today, uh, a little under a quarter of them uh, were from Bennington County. So as a percentage of the state's cases, uh, it's still obviously um, a significant proportion. So, uh, but again, we, we were seeing a slight downtick, which to me means um, we should continue to watch that for sure. Um, not, there's no you know, new outbreak to report there that would uh, dramatically increase the cases. So it again is people acquiring uh, the virus through, um, their daily lives and community transmission. Um, nothing more to really say on that front at this point in time. All right. You had mentioned something about the ski areas and about the uh, ability to work with them. Yes. Uh, would that be employee testing, or is that going to be testing of, um, of um, multi-day visitors or, or single-day visitors to, uh, to the areas? Yeah, so the goal would be that uh, there would be sort of all of the above, so opportunities for employees for sure, opportunities within the community that the area is in uh, as, a, as a site, and opportunities for those coming for a day to visit the uh, resort uh, to be able to get a PCR test and, um, um, you know, as they come in, so to speak, and then when that result is available in 24, 48 hours, they get that result. So it would be fairly broad in the audience it covered. Okay, uh, one more something for my question, uh, perhaps for Secretary Smith. Uh, you talked about um, being able to get uh, some vaccination to some homebound folks. Uh, you listed off of uh, some counties. Uh, Bennington County was not included in that, neither was Rutland. Uh, wondering if that's coming, if you can uh, talk about uh, if that will be coming up soon or what sort of ways you can you know, go in a little more detail about what the process is of getting uh, that population into the vaccine queue. Yeah, I would, I would just say stand by for next week. Um, we'll, I anticipate we'll have more to report on those counties and other counties next week. We just wanted to get started as quickly as possible. Start today. Uh, we had these uh, contracts and uh, the, both Home Health and the EMS were ready to go in these areas. So we've allocated the dosages to these individuals, uh, these entities and are uh, moving forward as we, uh, as, uh, and we'll have more to announce next week. Okay, 
Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. And I just wanted to add one quick uh, comment to the answer I gave previously, because people may be wondering, well, we have all these cases, et cetera, why do you want to set up more testing? And what you don't know, you don't know. Um, and because of the opportunity for this virus to spread so frequently from people who don't even know they have it and have no major symptoms uh, to others, um, one of the ways that we work on containment is actually identifying cases in people who wouldn't have thought they have it so that they can quickly protect others around them. So I would urge uh, people in Bennington County as these sites are announced, um, if you have second thoughts about, well, I don't need to test, whatever, you may actually want to get a test because it's part of the strategy of helping the county really reduce the uh, impact of the virus uh, real time. Thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, good afternoon, Governor. Uh, 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 1099 question. Um, it, it, just to clarify, you're saying that you've Look, it appears that you found what the error was, the human error was, and we can all imagine how that possibly could have happened in a large database or merge file. Um, and that you're looking into the quality control, and that, that was the big question a lot of people had, is, is not that an error could have happened, but why wasn't it, it caught? Is that, is that what the focus going, a lot of the focus going forward is going to be on? Yeah, the after action will be... Um and what we can do to, to prevent this from happening in the future and putting these quality control pieces uh, into place. Um, again, not to make excuses at all, but uh, we're dealing with a large number of uh, 1099s that we have never done before uh, due to the uh, large amount of unemployment uh, throughout the state due to the pandemic. So we've had to utilize not just labor, but uh, the agency D digital services as well as um, the tax department and others in trying to make sure that we get these out. So there's a lot of hands touching this. Uh, and so it's not the natural uh, type of progression that we've utilized in the past, but uh, that uh, is no excuse. Uh, we need to, uh, to make sure that we put these uh, quality control pieces into place and we prevent this from happening in the future. We should have done it uh, beforehand, but this one uh, got by us and we, uh, we need to do better. Well, I, I assume there there are ongoing protocols. You know, even a year ago or two years ago, there would have been uh, quality control protocols. Is it, is it, they were just missed, or, or I'm just trying to understand. Again, how, I think how that's the part of you know we've we've identified what we think happened, uh, and again, human error uh, based on. Uh, but that's again no excuse. It's not pinpointing the blame on any one person. It's just that we need these quality control pieces in, in place. So that's what we hope uh, the auditor will be able to identify. What, what can we put into place to make sure this uh, doesn't happen in, in cooperation with us uh, to see what we can do together uh, to make this a more uh, safe process. And um, so we're looking for the expertise uh, from the auditor and, um, and to try and uh, go into this uh, with, uh, with open eyes and, and see what we can do again, uh, not to criticize any one department or any one person, but uh, to just make the process work better. And uh, lastly, is, has uh, Commissioner Harrington's status or role changed at all? It has not, no. Um, he has uh, been at the wheel here. Uh, we've sent in uh, help, assistance. Uh, we named a, a deputy commissioner uh, as well to put these teams into place to assist uh, in trying to get through this. Uh, and again, uh, no, nothing has changed. I still have uh, faith in his uh, ability, and we need to, uh, to focus on the problem at hand and get through this and fix it uh, now. And uh, we'll contemplate uh, other actions later on, uh, depending on what we find. All right, great. Thank you very much. Peter, BPR. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I assume this question is for Secretary Smith. I'm wondering how many Vermonters who are not in the 1A group and who are also not 75 or over have received the COVID vaccine? Secretary Smith. In an ideal world, there'd be none. 
Uh, but uh, let's be realistic. There probably are people out here, out there that uh, have received it. I don't know what the number is, Peter, uh, but I can tell you that I firmly believe the majority of people who have received the vaccine qualify to receive the vaccine. I can't, I can't assure you that it's 100%, uh, but those that qualify, I think, uh, the vast majority that, of those that qualify have received the vaccine. I know that doesn't answer your question precisely, but I don't have a precise answer to that. Right, but, you, but I mean, you've been able to uh, quantify for us the number of folks in the 1A category, the number of people 75 and over, the number of people um, in long-term care facilities. So presumably there's some kind of accounting process whereby you're uh, calculating which group people are in when they get the vaccine. Um, is the state also keeping well, track of how many people are, are not in those groups are receiving the vaccine? We, we presume when people come in to get their 1A uh, vaccine through the hospital, the hospital administers the, basically the 1A program, we presume that those people that are there are qualified uh, to be in that 1A. I don't know, I'll check, Peter, if there's any sort of uh, statistics that we have on this, but I can tell you that if we've heard differently, we've stepped in uh, before. Uh, if there was any inkling that there was going to be vaccination of people that are not 1A, we've stepped in uh, and, and mentioned that they shouldn't be doing that. Um, but I don't, I don't know if I have a number I will, uh, I will double check. All right. But when you are telling the people who are administering these at the clinics, you know, use Vermont common sense, as you said, to make sure we don't have unnecessary, unnecessary spoilage. Um, and in the interest of achieving that, they give it to somebody who's not in one of those 1A or 75 over categories. The, that goes down in the state's numbers as having gone to somebody who is in 1A or 75 we, we, or over? In that instance, in that instance, we will know um, what the, that situation is. I just, you, you asked it's sort of in the previous phase of 1A if, um, and in continuing phase of 1A, that's hospital administered, uh, if we have those numbers, I'm just not sure we do of because I, everybody self, I, I would hope, are identifying as 1A and are 1A, but I will check on that for numbers. In the clinics, we know precisely uh, who's who uh, in terms of uh, what person is and why they're be giving, given a dose. If they're homebound, if they're 75 plus, or if it's an extra dose that they can't find anybody else to give, I've given instructions not to waste those. Um, I think, Peter, to be, if I had to predict, that's gonna be a very, very, very small percentage uh, of the population that we're vaccinating. Because the other day in the major snowstorm that we had, uh, we only had five no-shows. Um, and, and they were able to not waste uh, dosages from what I can understand during that snowstorm. So it's a very low number. I will try to get in, in some more information on it, but right now I don't have any statistics at hand on that. Thank you, Monk. I appreciate it. Ian Wallace Allen, BT Digger. Hi, thanks. Um, this question is for Secretary Curley. A business group sent a letter in late January to the agency asking for more predictability so events venues can plan for the warmer weather. Uh, they're asking the administration for some possible dates for opening based on measures like hitting vaccination targets, um, transmission rates, room and ICUs and things like that. Um, they're also asking the administration to make rapid testing available and affordable. Um, and they want the state to create a fast track review process for public event sites that have shown good performance in following the rules. Now, um, I know the administration has was repeatedly asked for predictions like this all through last year, but now that Vermont has a vaccine program and we know more about COVID-19 transmission, is there any way to give businesses any more scope for planning ahead? 
again, I'm going to let uh, Secretary Curley answer this, but I, I just wanted to reiterate some of what we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. Um, there's still the, we don't have a lot of faith in some respects. Uh, this has to be proven in terms of the supply. Uh, we've been told over the next three weeks we'll get a certain amount. Uh, they have expanded upon that, and uh, which is great news for us, but uh, they're not going any further. So it's difficult for us to make any predictions based on, uh, on not knowing what the supply is going to be. We also uh, know that they're um, hopefully going to approve the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which would be great news as well. That would help uh, as well as AstraZeneca. But, but we don't have enough information. And I, I'm very hesitant myself uh, to, to give anyone um, a number or a date uh, that we can't adhere to. So uh, we want to uh, make sure that we're factual when we give dates and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to in the near future. Uh, but looking back, uh, for those, I answered a question like this yesterday on a, a Lake Champlain Chamber uh, event. If you look back at where we were um, last summer, and we had a low number of cases, we had uh, practically uh, no deaths over a period of a few months, um, we were uh, in a much better place then, uh, just because of being outside and, and not people not being inside uh, for different uh, uh, events and so forth, we were able to open up the economy. Uh, knowing that, uh, what we experienced then, I believe we'll be back to that uh, again this year, and uh, and we'll be able to do more, especially with a with a vaccine that we have. So, uh, I have a great amount of hope uh, that we'll be closer, much closer to normal, uh, midsummer uh, than uh, we have before. Um, but at this point in time, it's just difficult to give that date that they're looking for specifically. Uh, but hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to uh, to have more faith in the process and, again, the supply coming in uh, to the state uh, from the federal government. Um, Secretary Curley. Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, I'm glad you took the really hard part of the question, which is definitely about the predictability of the vaccine. Um, I'll just elaborate and acknowledge that, yes, you know, we did receive a letter. We've actually received several letters, a great deal of feedback and some suggestions on a restart plan for events this summer. And as we have done throughout this crisis, the restart team is working really closely with the industry and community leaders to understand their concerns and to try to determine the best path forward. Um, and, of course, we all have the same goal, which is to protect, protect the health and safety of Vermonters and balance the need to open up our economy as we navigate, as you suggest, this next phase of the pandemic. Um, that being said, there is a path forward for modified events at this time um, with a current event guidance in place. Again, that's on our website, and we are encouraging event planners to continue to be creative, just like they were through the summer and fall, and creating experiences that are within the ACCD guidelines. Um, so really, you know, again, if people are planning events now, uh, make sure you're checking our website to, to consider the possibilities. And again, you know, as, as things improve, um, as the governor said, hard to put a specific date on it, but as we continue to open up more broadly, um, we are excited to, to bring events back in Vermont and to do it in a safe manner. Um, okay, thanks. All right, all set, Ann? Yeah, that'll do it. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Uh, hello, Governor. Uh, uh, apartment construction was cut in half in Chittenden County last year because of the pandemic. More people are moving here for COVID-related reasons. Seems our affordable housing crisis is even worse than usual. Um, is, is there an, a holistic strategy or solution to Vermont's housing crisis on the table? Well, obviously, uh, in my budget address, I addressed uh, a lot of the issues in terms of housing. We put more money to the VACB, um, about $20 million, uh, as well as some other initiatives that uh, we hope will help uh, with this uh, surplus money uh, that we have available, the one-time money uh, that uh, we have on the bottom line. So uh, again, I, I believe that we're on a path to, to help in that regard. We, uh, we All the construction companies are open at this point, although they're very, very busy. 
um, and that's because of uh, some of the activity with home improvements and so forth uh, throughout the state. So uh, we have to go work hand in hand on this and we need more people. We need more workers as well uh, to mm -hmm. fill the jobs that we have. So this is uh, complicated, uh, and, uh, but at the same time, I, I believe that uh, we have a path forward and uh, we're working again with the legislature as well as within the, uh, with our commissioner of housing and other uh, interested uh, groups. And we think we have a plan that, that can work and can really assist in uh, our long-term uh, needs for those uh, needing housing, affordable housing at that. Okay. Um, also, I'm sorry if this has already been brought up, but um, could you please explain why Steve Merrill of NEKTV has lost his press credentials and are, are you open to restoring them? Well, sure. Um, here's uh, from my perspective. Um, we try to provide these uh, press briefings uh, twice a week. Uh, as you know, uh, we've had over 100 of these uh, since the very beginning to try and give Vermonters details on what's happening with COVID. Um, for the most part, we have been able to see uh, the major news networks, the uh, the, the printable um, uh, papers, and and as well as those online, we see every day. Um, we we may not agree with everything uh, in in terms of of how you present what we have tried to present, uh, but you're you're printing it and you're you're putting it out to uh, members of of um, uh, to Vermonters, and that's been our goal, uh, and we. Um, after um, last week on Tuesday, uh, we've never really known uh, what Steve has been doing with the information. He's a, an interesting character from the Northeast Kingdom. We like to have that perspective. Um, but, um, but when we looked back to what he was doing uh, with the information, he wasn't providing news. He wasn't, you know, um, he wasn't expanding upon that and giving the news out to, uh, to Vermonters as we had envisioned and had hoped and we had, we had adhered uh, to. Um, and um, so he was actually using uh, some of the uh, information that we were giving as fodder for an entertainment program uh, that he had um, and with the public access. So that's not what we had in mind. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we are asking all the media uh, to, if you're going to call in, if you're going to ask questions, we respect that, we want that. Uh, we haven't been shutting down, as we, you know, sometimes these go for two and a half hours, so it's not as though we're trying to limit anybody's access. Uh, but we, act, we want respect uh, on, the other, on the other side as well, that you're going to use this information uh, to inform Vermonters. And um, we just didn't see it in this case. This was for, and I'll use this term loosely, uh, saw some of what uh, Steve had been doing, and uh, it was just plain entertainment maybe comedy, but I use that term very loosely. Now, could it be sort of like the John Stewart show, though? I mean, that's comedy, but a lot of people look at that, or, or, or Colbert, I suppose now, uh, look at that as sort of a source of news. I mean, so maybe, can you look at it that way, too? I, I would not uh, look at it that way. Um, and uh, if Steve Colbert uh, called in and wanted to ask questions to use it for fodder on his program, I would probably turn him down as well. So it, it's just a simple test. You know, this is information. Uh, these are uh, media briefings uh, about COVID. Um, and it's not to uh, promote your, uh, your entertainment uh, program that you might have. Okay, thank you. Hi, I had a question. Um, we're seeing reports, there was one in the New York Times about uh, so-called vaccine hunters crossing state lines. Um, they say that there's some groups that are even spreading the word on social media. Um, I was just wondering if this is something, uh, Governor Scott and Dr. Levine, if you consider this to be sort of a problem of sorts and the ethical dilemma of whether or not to turn them away, um, you know, given Vermont is kind of a state surrounded by people with higher population centers, maybe having to wait longer over there to get their vaccine. How, how is this being approached? Well, again, uh, from our perspective, we're only vaccinating Vermonters at this point. So that's... That's all, I mean, we, we, I'm aware uh, of this. I've read uh, some of uh, the reports, uh, but, um, but we're requiring them to be Vermonters. So um, 
again, doesn't mean that someone isn't getting in. That's not appropriate, uh, but uh, but that's our but that's our test. Anything else, Dr. Levine? Yeah, we haven't. Seen, yeah, and again, I don't believe we have uh, we have found any of those cases here in Vermont. Thank you. Pam Davis of Vermont Journal. Uh, good morning. In the in the light of the uh, what the governor just said about uh, what kind of questions you want here, I have really two questions. One is for uh, um, to, for Mike Smith about health care reform. It's not it's not really directly connected to the virus. I have a, a secondary question for Mark uh, Levine, um, which is a sort of a clarity question. So if if uh, if if you want to do it, if Mike, uh, my main question is for. Uh, Mike Smith, and it's, it's, do you want that question, sir? Sure. Secretary Smith. The, um, I'm sorry. Uh, my, my question, uh, uh, Secretary Smith, is this. Um, the the health care reform has been going on here for 10 years, but just in the last three or four days, the last few days, uh, there's been a, what I consider anyway to be a striking development, which is the decision by the Attorney General to uh, sue One Care Vermont on behalf of the auditor on, on, on to get some information on One Care salaries, uh, One Care, uh, One Care Vermont has pledged to fight this suit. And what I'm curious about is it, it, it's my, just my opinion. I'm I, I write all the time about healthcare reform. It's just my opinion that that's a, that, that this is a striking development. And I wonder if I could ask you. If you would assess, if we could get your views about what you think of this this suit, what you think of how you assess it, if you do, and also if you could, if you would say how you think it how you think it will affect the whole healthcare reform process, especially given your your wish to reboot One Care. Oh, well, thanks, Ham. There, there's a lot in there. Um, let me sort of distill that down into sort of three points. First of all, this is a squabble between the auditor's office and One Care Vermont. We're going to stay out of this. Um, this is between those two entities. Uh, the agency or DIVA uh, doesn't need to be involved. From DIVA's perspective, and DIVA is the Department of Vermont Health Access, which is a department within the agency. Um, you know, our contract with One Care, from our perspective, uh, gives us access to One Care's financial and accounting records as they relate to One Care's ability to perform under the contract. Uh, uh, we also have metrics in that contract uh, to evaluate quality and performance standards. So, from from that aspect and the transparency aspect of that contract. Um, we're, we're fairly satisfied with the transparency aspect of it. I do want to say one other thing. Um, I, about a year ago, I pushed for um, release of uh, the salaries of those at the higher level of One Care. I asked them to produce a 990-like uh, disclosure, which as you know, if you're a nonprofit, they aren't right now, but I want them to act like a nonprofit uh, that you list the, the salaries of the executives of that agency. I didn't ask what the auditor is asking for, which is the salaries of people like the receptionist, uh, maybe an executive assistant and others. I asked for the top salary of uh, those individuals. Uh, One Care did submit that information. I also asked One Care if they would file with the IRS as a nonprofit, uh, which they have. Uh, they have to be approved by the IRS, which they have that hasn't been done yet, uh, in order to file for uh, uh, as a nonprofit. In terms of the overall sort of administrative uh, expense of One Care, um, you know, is as Many many people may think it's in my purview. It isn't. It's it's with the Green Mountain Care Board. If they 
want to see those salaries, they can also ask uh, to see those salaries. But um, from my point of view, uh, for the for the execution of the contract that we have with uh, with the ACO, uh, we have enough look see into their financials to make us feel comfortable. And I'm just going to. Uh, um, not allow the agency. We've got a lot going on with uh, COVID and a lot going on with a lot of other things. Um, we're going to leave this between the auditor and one care. Uh, thank you very much. That, I think that you may not have think that thought was helpful, but I did. Uh, if I have one more question, a small question for Dr. Levine, but I've used up my time. So if he wants to take it, otherwise I'm, I'm done. Uh, it, uh, it, the uh, for Dr. Levine, Dr. Levine, you the uh, you know you you dealt earlier in the in the program with uh, with the uh, some of the questions that are coming out of the variant issue and and its connection with the vaccine program. I want I, I the I understand about the transmissibility question. I, I understand that pretty clearly. But what I I'm not hearing much about it, and I have not been able to see much. Uh, on the web is the is the the direct question not of transmissibility but the question of the extent to which the two main virus the two main vaccines uh, uh, Moderna and Pfizer okay whether they what what information do you could you sum up with the known information about the ability of the two main uh, main vaccines in the field today okay to to cope with variant the variant. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is evolving information. So take nothing that I say as certain because obviously all around the world, people are investigating this uh, consist constantly. But the two va available vaccines in this country, Moderna and Pfizer, seem to be effective against the B117 variant. Um, I can't put a number to that yet in terms of uh, the level of effectiveness, but certainly um, people have been reassured, if nothing else, by some of the early data showing some uh, efficacy against that variant. The South Africa variant is one that um, is concerning. Fortunately, not one that we've seen in this country much. A couple of cases in the South, and I haven't heard any since. So uh, we'll have to see how that one plays out. Uh, but that is still um, a concern. The problem in the variant game is that, you know, the virus has really international penetration now, and around the world, uh, you do see different strains of the virus, and that's how some of the reinfection data came about. When we wondered if you could get coronavirus again, we found cases where they had one strain, recovered, and then four months later, came down with another illness that was like COVID, and it turned out they had another strain of the virus. Um, they had a less severe course, so some of their residual immunity was obviously uh, impacting favorably. So it's a really complicated game when you start talking about variants because you're talking about a virus that tends to mutate, and it will show the impact of the mutation even more when it is at such a worldwide prevalence as it is now and in many settings, frankly, not well controlled at all. Um, so again, getting the level of control down r right now before any of the variants really take hold is really a core part of everybody's strategy. So we can do as much suppression of transmission of virus as possible. Uh, thank you very much for that. Just one tiny follow-up. Do we? Is your system that you've set up in the state of Vermont with you, are you ready to capture the extent to the, uh, the if the current vaccines that are out there, if there any of the people that have been vaccinated are getting COVID in spite of the vaccine? Not transmissibility, but whether the whether the the uh, person that's been vac been vaccinated uh, has is got, it gets one of the gets COVID. Yeah. So basically, uh, is there a failure rate to the vaccine? that we're going to start seeing. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so, exactly. so, so yes. that is a core part of the interview of any case now that we have vaccine. Um, I can't tell you there's more than a very small number of people who have said 
that they had the vaccine, but often it's during the time course that they're getting the vaccine and they wouldn't have had a chance to get fully immune. Uh, and we've even seen people within a few days of getting the vaccine get a case of COVID and the most likely response there is they already were incubating it from before and it just so happens they got the vaccine uh, a couple of days earlier. But we are looking for that uh, and we will know about it because everybody who becomes a case, that is a question that we'll be uh, seeking out. Thank you very much. Yes, good afternoon. A couple of quick questions. I understand that people with chronic conditions might be eligible to be pushed on top of the list to receive the vaccine, but who makes that call? Uh, and who, if somebody has a chronic condition, who should they contact? Is it their uh, PCP or specialist? And we're also wondering what uh, Secretary French plans to discuss when he plans to meet with music educators on Tuesday and if he can give us kind of an insight on what the what, what that will look like and when students uh, participating in fine arts might be able to um, go back to normal activities. Yeah, just to be clear, uh, Chris, at this point in time, unless you're 75 and older, even if you have a chronic condition, you aren't put on the list now. Uh, we're, that's another phase uh, after we get through the, the age banding uh, 65 and over, and that'll be the next, uh, next phase we go into. Uh, Commissioner Levine. And I, and I certainly haven't uh, given permission or authorized anybody who was not in the 75 older ba age band to, to get vaccinated. So uh, if that was sort of the theme behind your question from what you'd heard, uh, we certainly unfortunately have had to um, give a lot of bad news to people uh, and haven't been able to help them out in the way they'd like to be helped. When you mentioned their physicians, um, so there is a list of the conditions um, that um, we've talked about here and is on the website as well. Um, and that is the list at this point in time. Doesn't mean it doesn't have the opportunity to evolve. And it, there are several conditions we're looking into more actively and working with the CDC with as well and our own implementation advisory group. Um, we haven't yet come out with uh, how a person with those conditions uh, makes that known and goes on the registration site because that's several bands away and we're actually having active discussions within our own vaccine task team about how to make that happen logistically. It's not an urgent matter uh, on February 5th, uh, so we don't have it settled quite yet, but we will. And we do want to make sure we respect the healthcare workforce uh, and not ask too much of them in terms of um, attesting to uh, every aspect of a person's care and trying to get them uh, moved into a list or above a list or what have you. Does that answer those questions before I turn it over to Secretary French? It does, thank you very much. I'm sorry for my misunderstanding. Thanks for your question, Steve. Um, in terms of music, you know, again, it's, it's probably been one of the more challenging areas for us to, to develop guidance in. Uh, we have met on and off since August with music teachers and um, our medical folks, uh, including our infectious disease experts. Um, before the holidays, uh, we had a meeting of the group um, and then followed up with an internal meeting. Um, and we, in that meeting, I looked specifically at guidance from Connecticut as sort of a prototype, uh, just as a way to, uh, to better understand what were the, some of the concerns uh, from a public health perspective. So this meeting uh, that we're going to have on the 9th is a, kind of a follow-up for that. Uh, I've asked the Music Teachers Association if they uh, would be interested in, in doing sort of a surveillance inventory, if you will, of the other music guidance in New England and to a certain extent nationally. Um, and they have done that, actually. They shared it with me uh, right around the beginning of the press conference. So uh, we're going to take a look at um, how other states are approaching this issue and uh, what the conversation looks like at the national level. We'll have a few national people in uh, on the conversation as well. 
Um, so the goal is to just really sort of understand what, what would model guidance look like, and then we'll take that um, internally and see uh, if we can map that out on an implementation timeline to our comfort relative uh, to the conditions of the virus in Vermont. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if the state is thinking about utilizing uh, dentists, veterinarians, or other individuals with vaccine training to speed up uh, distribution here in Vermont? Um, again, to speed it up, uh, we have all the uh, staff we need at this point uh, to, uh, with the supply we're, we're receiving. But if we were to ramp up, I think a lot of those uh, situations are being considered. Uh, Dr. Levine? And that's exactly correct. I'll just add one sentence. Uh, uh, we've received a number of inquiries, just like the ones you mentioned, and we're very much appreciative of that. And we would love to have 100,000 doses a day to deliver to the population so we could use everybody and all hands on deck. Uh, but we do have a medical reserve corps, and we've instructed a lot of people to have their names in there. Some have already been uh, taken from the Medical Reserve Corps to participate in this effort. So uh, stay tuned in terms of doses allocated and opportunities that we have to further enlist the aids of groups like the ones you mentioned. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Hello. You all mentioned the Super Bowl earlier in the press conference and gatherings that could arise from that. Do you see this period of time as kind of the last hurdle we need to get through before you really start considering opening up some of the gathering restrictions? Yeah, I don't know if it's the last hurdle. We still have uh, uh, President's Day weekend. Uh, we have the Daytona 500. There's always events uh, almost every week that give us a, a little bit of concern. So uh, I think getting through the winter uh, is key. Uh, because of, uh, you know, we're, we're inside more um, in uh, confined spaces and so forth. Once we can get out, get into the spring, and we can get outside, uh, I think that will alleviate a lot of concern. Dr. Levine, anything to add? Does that answer the question, Avery? It did. Thank you. <laughs> the um, kind of task force or, or panel that was advising you on school issues um, recommended the reopening of school sports games and any of the infectious disease experts had any concerns about transmission during competition. I didn't really get all that, but uh, Secretary Moore, did you get the flavor of that? Uh, so we do have a working group um, comprised of representatives from the, the VPA, Superintendents Association, Principals Association, as well as a couple of the um, infectious disease, pediatric infectious disease experts from UVM, and we've continued to consult with them um, throughout the process. In addition to that, we, we combine their input and feedback um, with evaluation that's being done by staff within the, the health department in particular, um, looking at cases and, and case levels. Uh, I think it's accurate to say that, that everyone has concerns, um, that there is a, some amount of risk associated with uh, taking these next steps with sports. Um, and that's why it is so important that Vermont players and coaches and parents continue to observe all of those safety protocols. Um, it's not a sure thing that we'll be able to, to prevent all disease transmission um, while playing sports. Um, but at this point, we felt like it was a, a reasonable risk to take. So would it be accurate to say that the uh, experts on the task force endorse this policy? We don't. The, the, I, I guess I don't feel like I'm in a position to, to represent their position. We, it's more of a, a discussion and working group. We don't vote or anything where I'd be able to, to characterize that. Um, I do think it's fair to say that, that folks had concerns that were expressed and shared with the team and, and certainly discussed. 
Okay, thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, a couple of quick ones for Secretary Smith. Uh, first, uh, the Beecher Falls uh, Clinic that you said was added, do you have any of the details on that in terms of uh, date, dose allocation, and who's running it? I don't, Andrew, but I'll get it to you uh, in terms of what is going on. That was just added um, uh, because we, as you pointed out last time, we thought you, there was some exposure in the north that we needed to um, uh, make sure that we had a vaccination clinic there. I think the word exposure is not the right word. The word is we had um, we had a gap in our uh, vaccination uh, system that we thought would be filled by putting in a, uh, a site at Beecher Falls. But I'll let you know um, as soon as I get the information. Okay, thank you. And while you're at the podium uh, on the homebound initiative you described earlier, um, when do you expect the home health and EMS agencies to begin their outreach to clients, and when will doses uh, start being delivered with these first few groups? Yeah, they're being delivered today, and I think that you'll start seeing vaccinations uh, within the uh, starting today, um, but mostly starting next week, and then we'll add on these um, uh, these other organizations, uh, home health organizations, and EMS. Uh, later on as well. Okay, so the doses have already been allocated to the local partners? Yeah, they have. Been. And in some cases already delivered. Um, yeah, the, the homebound? Uh, I, yeah, let me just make sure I'm clear uh, on that, um, Andrew. The doses have been delivered or are being delivered to the um, entities. That either they're on their way or they have been delivered to these various entities that I described. Um, they are scheduled to uh, start today in terms of vaccinations. I don't know if those vaccinations have actually started yet, but they're scheduled to start. Okay. And um, uh, when they are scheduling with clients, uh, it, it's, does the same age banding restrictions apply? To, if, you yes. Know, say a, yes. A, 72-year-old person is homebound, do, do they have to wait? Yeah, they will have to wait. Uh, we're okay. doing it by age. All right, thank you. Okay. And just so everybody knows, because I usually repeat it, but I'll, I'll, I haven't today, we've started with the 75 plus, then we'll move to the 70 plus, then we'll move to 65 plus, and then we'll move 64 uh, to 16, with uh, chronic, uh, with uh, underlying health conditions, uh, as we uh, move forward, that's sort of the band approach we're taking. I would assume, as the governor said, in the next few weeks, you'll start hearing about our move to seventy plus. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it, it's really encouraging to learn today that the state's able to begin loosening restrictions on, on youth competitive indoor sports activities, uh, which are really essential to the physical and mental health of our kids. But my question is about adult indoor recreational activities, such as bowling leagues, indoor tennis competitions, adult hockey, et cetera, uh, which are equally important to the mental health and physical fitness of our adults. So my question is, is a decision about opening up those opportunities based on some of the same parameters as they're being applied to multi-household gatherings, such as the Super Bowl? Uh, Secretary Moore. Uh, thank you for that question. So there, there are some opportunities for adults to participate, particularly in, in group instruction classes, things like Pilates, yoga, et cetera, spinning classes. 
um, that fall under Section 8.1 of the ACCD guidance. So I just want to make sure it's clear that there, there are opportunities for adults to continue to access physical fitness activities indoors during the winter because we very much agree with your assessment about the important mental health benefits of those activities. Um, in terms of adults in, in more competitive sports, this, this is the, probably the next step we're going to be looking at. Um, but this is, as the governor described in his opening, part of the, the going slow and taking a measured, cautious approach. Um, we know that, that it was um, of most importance or of greatest importance to return youth athletes to, to play and have taken steps to do that. Um, and we'll be looking next um, for to create opportunities for adult athletes. Certainly as the opportunities to play outside uh, grow and expand as we get closer to spring, um, the intention would be to, to make those available, broadly available to as many Vermonters as possible as outdoor recreation activities like skiing are right now. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary Moore. Uh, and then I have a second question uh, for the governor. Uh, Governor Scott, what do you feel are the most critical components you'd like to see come out of the next stimulus and relief package from Washington? Um, seems like that's particularly uh, increasingly imminent given the Senate's action overnight uh, and the first steps in moving forward President Biden's $1.9 trillion aid package. What are you looking for for relief from the state level? Yeah, again, relief uh, for individuals, individual families and so forth. I think that that's uh, an initiative that we can all agree to. Um, unemployment, uh, making sure there's an extension there for those who are impacted. Uh, relief grants of some sort for um, businesses uh, that are suffering, especially in the hospitality sector. Uh, which we know have been uh, greatly affected uh, by uh, this um, the last 11 months. Um, and uh, from there, um, there are a number of initiatives that we'd like to see uh, move forward, but, uh, but I'd say those are the, the top tier. Hey, thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. Derek, seven days. I have a question for the governor. Um, I understand uh, you may not be putting forth a plan uh, to address the state's pension obligation, but I'm wondering if your office is uh, in active conversation with lawmakers about it, and uh, if so, how those conversations are going. Well, again, I have uh, been saying for the last four years that uh, we need to do something. Um, we've, been, uh, we've been talking about this uh, for quite some time. I'm encouraged that the, uh, the treasurer, Treasurer Pierce, has moved forward with a plan. I think it's uh, incumbent upon all of us to, to work on that plan. We don't have to come up with our own. Uh, we'll, uh, we're an active uh, participant. We'll be at the table uh, and a willing partner. And the leg But the legislature has to be involved too. So uh, again, there's an equal opportunity for all of us uh, to get involved because what we're seeing right now with a multi-billion dollar uh, unfunded liability is just not sustainable. And so I think we recognize that and again, we want to, uh, to do whatever we can to assist uh, Treasurer Pierce in, uh, in her plan and, and try to come together. Okay, thank you. We're gonna try to go back to Kat at WCAX. Hi, are you able to hear me this time? We can. Great, all right, so this one is for Secretary Smith or Dr. Levine. I had a family reach out to me their eight-year-old daughter is a brain cancer patient. Because of her young age, she is not eligible to receive the vaccine when the individual 16 plus with compromising conditions like cancer can get their shots. Her parents are concerned that if one of them gets sick with COVID, it would impact their ability to get their child through her weekly treatment. I know that they aren't the only family in Vermont with a child who is in a similar situation. So is the state considering any provisions that would allow the parents of immunocompromised pediatric patients get vaccinated earlier? Yes, Kat, thank you for that question. That's a not uncommonly asked question, whether the child have cancer or, or any other disease or require more chronic care due to some uh, congenital or developmental disability, et cetera. There are also abundant adults who are on immunosuppressive medications or believe their conditions uh, suppress their immune system. And the requests are, as your 
final phrase implied, uh, rather abundant. Uh, so we would be actually jumping a lot of people in that category uh, ahead of the people in the 75 and older, not to mention uh, 70 or 65. So again, we're trying to really be uh, adherent to our philosophy and our policy of preventing deaths uh, and looking at the most vulnerable populations that could have that as an outcome and vaccinate them first. I know it sounds harsh, it's challenging, um, it, it's heartbreaking to be honest at times, and I would love to see more vaccines so we can make these decisions uh, on the basis of having an abundance rather than a scarcity of that resource. But, that is my answer. To clarify, I don't think they were asking to go ahead of the seniors. I think they were wondering if parents of immunocompromised patients who can't get a vaccine might be considered, because of their age only, might be considered yeah. Yeah. as part of a group following you know, the, the um, vulnerable individuals or something like that. Right, so the answer at this point in time is no, but as you know, we haven't announced any further phases beyond the groups that we've already talked about, so um, there's a lot of possibilities in the future, um, but we're not there yet. And then I guess the broadest follow-up I have, where do we stand with youth under the age of 16 being able to get vaccinated? Has the CDC given any indication of when some of those trials on kids might be wrapped up um, enough to give a green light for the younger than 16 group? Yeah, so some of the platforms that we don't have all the data in on yet have had more pediatric enrollment in their studies. And, uh, and of course, those vaccines aren't yet available, so we can't say much more than that. But I am pretty clear, and I, I have very little doubt that there will be a vaccine at some point that can be given to those under 16. I don't know if it'll be the two that we're using now, just because I'm not familiar with the uh, ongoing studies they're doing if they're uh, looking at the pediatric age range specifically. But I'm quite confident that there will be a vaccine, uh, possibly in a platform we haven't yet seen or proved here for pediatrics. But I, I don't have a timeline for you. It's, it's certainly not immediate, that's for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, thanks for your patience, Governor. Um, I'm hoping that somebody can fill us in on what the health department is seeing as a cause for a rise in cases in Franklin County. Uh, what kind of outbreaks have you seen in the county? And, and specifically, um, I'm hearing about outbreaks in uh, Richford and an outbreak related to a uh, paper mill. What, what can you uh, do to fill us in on some of that information? Yeah, it is an interesting uh, dilemma in some respects. We we were looking at that uh, the other night, but uh, Dr. Levine? Yeah, I wish I could shed tremendous light on the question you have. Um, as you know, there have been some long-term care facilities in Franklin County. Um, those seem to be cooling off at this point in time and not contributing abundant cases. There are also a few work sites, and I'm pretty confident the majority of them have had uh, a handful, certainly under a half a dozen cases. So if they technically fit the uh, definition of outbreak, they're not an outbreak on the scale of the Central Vermont ice hockey outbreak or anything of that sort. So I, I don't really have a smoking gun to give you with regards to something. I will uh, go back to the team this afternoon and see if they have any other insight into that and report back. But I'm not uh, seeing large outbreaks that are going to help guide you if that means anything. I appreciate that. Uh, I'd appreciate that follow-up info at, at some point. Uh, and the other follow-up I have, I, I understand, uh, I wasn't able to listen to the first half. I understand that you're starting sports in about a week. Um, I'm, I'm hearing from some very frustrated music teachers, drama teachers, people in the performing arts that, uh, that, that students that, um, have, that use that as their outlet are being overlooked. Um, sports have at least been given the green light 
uh, leading up to now to practice and, and play within their school. Uh, why is it that the, the state has given more of a green light to sports again and, and still not done anything with performing arts? I'm going to let Secretary French handle most of that, but he did have a commentary uh, not too many minutes ago about uh, music specifically and where we're headed on that in terms of uh, the future guidance and discussions, but I'll, I'll let him elaborate further. Could you repeat part of the question? I missed it. Um, so I'm just wondering why the state chose to continue to open up sports uh, before at least making one uh, initial step to, to open up kind of the performing arts, music, drama, uh, stuff like that. It, it, I'm hearing a lot from people in those communities that are frustrated seeing their, their student athletes at least being given um, different segments of opening and feeling that their own programs aren't being given anything. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. We do get that question quite often. Um, you know, basically the answer is we look at each activity uh, that students are involved in separately and evaluate them separately for risk uh, relative to COVID. So even as you've heard, even among sports, we uh, break sports down into different sports and some sports we're more comfortable than others. So it's, it's not necessarily a question of, um, you know, authorizing one thing and making sure the others are authorized. We do look at each activity uh, very discreetly and, and music, as I mentioned, has been uh, more challenging, I think. It's probably, from my perspective, the most challenging area we've had um, for a number of reasons. And, and part of it is just the fact of the aspiration in a closed space, particularly as we've moved inside. But um, we do, you know, we, we acknowledge that all these activities are critical uh, for the health of our students, particularly as we contemplate uh, moving into sort of a recovery phase. And, um, you know, we definitely want to see if we can find a path forward in music and the arts. It's such a critical element of our students' well-being and the vibrancy of our school communities. Is there any sort of scientific data that, that would show that uh, somebody playing a trumpet produces more aerosolized infection than somebody running up and down a basketball court, you know, next to somebody else who's guarding them? Yeah, I'm not sure about the comparison uh, from a trumpet to basketball per se, but there's a lot of analysis that's gone on looking at specific instruments uh, in particular and different uh, performing arts activities. The challenge with some of that research is that it's in a very controlled environment, in a laboratory, if you will, and that doesn't necessarily uh, represent the real world uh, experience of a music room or an ensemble uh, space. So. We, we do look at that information, um, but ultimately we have to make an assessment based on the real world conditions of our schools and um, how, how, the, uh, how the activities would actually be implemented. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. And again, thank you, Governor, for, and Brittany for coming back around to me. I, I know I wasn't available earlier, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Andrew, Dina TV. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Go ahead, Andrew. Hi. Uh, I guess this is a question for Secretary Smith. Um, uh, there's a, a new vaccine clinic opening up uh, today in, in Manchester at Burn Burton Academy. It'll be open, my understanding is, for the next for today and the next three Fridays through, uh, through February. Uh, I guess I was just wondering if there are any plans to continue to have uh, a vaccine clinic option uh, available up at this end of Bennington County, uh, in addition to the main one being done at the, uh, the by the SVMC at the former uh, Southern Vermont College Gymnasium. Uh, and I guess what would be the metrics that would determine that? The number of uh, registrations, or would there be another another metric you would use? Um, I'll refer to Secretary Smith. I'm, I'm not sure that he knows about the one at Burr and Burton at this point. So. Thanks, Andrew. Um, you're surprising me, and, and uh, I've told my team never allow uh, reporters to surprise me on this. Um, <laughs> I, I, um, Sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure on the Burr and Burton, but um, we are. We what we're doing is um, putting in place a pretty 
um, pretty elaborate system in terms of vaccination sites. And we're trying to do sort of mimic what we did with testing, that you're no further than 30 minutes away from any sort of vaccination site in this state. And what, um, what we do is put into place, you have Southern, uh, Southern Vermont uh, Medical Center, obviously, and I guess Burn Burton. Um, but the, the situation we do is look uh, every week at where we see gaps. And if we see any gaps uh, that we need to fill, we will fill them. And, and Bennington County is, uh, is no different. So we will look at Bennington County in the same way that we look at every county. And, and uh, we do that evaluation usually in the first part of the week. Okay, thank you very much. I do have uh, a follow-up question. Well, not, it's not really a follow-up, but uh, another question for Dr. Levine, if, if uh, I could squeeze it in. Uh, this is a question that came in from one of our uh, viewers, uh, and it's a, qu a question about the number of times uh, a specimen uh, goes through a cycle of analysis uh, to determine whether or not a person tests positive or negative for, uh, for uh, uh, coronavirus on a PCR test. My understanding is uh, that the World Health Organization originally had a standard of 45 cycles that a, a specimen would have to be run through uh, to detect a virus, but they've lowered that number. The question uh, was, when, when someone tests positive for COVID-19, uh, why can't that positive result come with a number that signifies how many cycles it took before they detected the virus? And I hope I'm expressing that clearly. And You are. You are. In a way, it's understandable. Um, so I feel like Steve is in the room today because we're talking about cycle thresholds, CT values. And when you look at the emergency use authorization that the FDA has given to all of the PCR tests, this is considered to be a qualitative test, not a quantitative test. So the result is you either show COVID-19 uh, viral, you know, SARS-CoV-2 virus activity or you don't. And there are so many variables that go into the cycle threshold, some of them technical at the level of the lab, some of them technical at the level of getting the specimen from the patient, and many others, that it's not considered to be reliable to use it in a quantitative fashion. So the goal of all of our testing right now is find people who are symptomatic in let them know if they have the disease or not, and find people who are asymptomatic and let them know if they're harboring the disease or not so that good outcomes can occur on a population-wide basis. So it's a little less um, relevant, if you will, to know the quantitative nature of how many cycles did it go through. It's much more important to be able to act on the information that virus was detected. Now, I know there are shortcomings to that, which we won't have to go into today in terms of the arguments for and against, but it's only authorized as a qualitative test, not to be used in this quantitative fashion. I see. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate your answer. Well, that's it. Uh, thank you for your patience, and we'll see you again on Tuesday.